Okay, so today we're going to keep walking our way through the different processes going on in our kidneys. So thus far, we talked about filtration happening at the glomerulus and in the renal corpuscles. So we have fluid and solutes coming out of the blood in this capillary bed and moving into our nephron as uh, filtrate. It'll ultimately become urine after we do some fiddling with its contents. Okay, nice. and we talked about all the different pressures that drive exactly how much fluid is going into the nephron, okay? And we talked about the process of reabsorption. So we had our mass reabsorber in our proximal tubule. So meaning that we are reabsorbing many things that were in this filtrate and moving them back into our bloodstream. So we have movement from the proximal tubule into these paratubular capillaries that lie alongside the nephron. So we can see that blood came into the glomerulus through the afferent arterial, swirled around, formed this capillary bed called the glomerulus, left via the efferent arterial, and then we continue to have capillary beds alongside the nephron throughout the kidney. So we saw that we have a lot of reabsorption of water here in the proximal tubule, and we have a fair amount of reabsorption of salts. So we saw that we have reabsorption of sodium and chloride ions, and especially we focused on reabsorption of glucose. So we know that we want to reabsorb 100% of our glucose if we can, um, we can do that so long as we are below the renal threshold for glucose, which is the amount of glucose that we have in the plasma that we can safely handle with the number of transporters that exist for glucose in the proximal tubule. So we had a maximum rate for those transporters as well. Uh, and we've talked about this potential saturation of those transporters if we have too much glucose in the blood. Okay. So continuing on with these directional processes, we can see on this little map here that we also have the possibility of moving things from those paratubular capillaries. So from this continued bloodstream into the nephron later on. So this is the same direction as filtration, right? But it's not happening at the head of the nephron. It's not happening here between the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. It's happening in, on this diagram, our proximal tubule. We'll see some potentially happening later on as well. So that's secretion. So if we say we secrete a substance into the nephron, this is what we mean, that somewhere later on in the process, we added it into the filtrate kind of at a later date. Okay. Finally, our final directional process is if you urinate something out, that's excretion. So these are our four kind of directional terms that we can think of for substances. So filtration, getting into the nephron, reabsorption, going from the nephron back into your bloodstream, secretion from some later part of the bloodstream into the nephron, and excretion, just totally leaving your body. So the barriers here are the same for secretion as they were for reabsorption. So we've got to cross that endothelial layer of the capillary. So we have to go through the walls of the capillary. There's a basement membrane sticking stuff together, a little bit of fluid, paratubular fluid, a little bit of space there. And then we have to go through the epithelial lining of the nephron itself. And so just a reminder, we say endothelial about capillaries because that's the inside of your body, your nephron, 
we can think of as almost being open to the outside world, right? Because that nephron is going to connect up to your major and minor calyces in the kidney, the renal pelvis, go out the helum into the ureter, into your bladder, and then through your sphincters, out the urethra and out to the rest of the world, right? So we're open to the outside, which is why we have the epithelial word for the, the cells lining the nephron. Okay. So substances that get secreted by your kidneys, so later adjustments to the filtrate later on, can be things like potassium. Uh, we're going to see hydrogen ions, so especially as we are trying to balance pH, which we'll get to near the end of the unit. Hydrogen ions are super related to pH as part of how it's defined, right? So one of the ways we'll be able to do that is by secreting hydrogen ions. Uh, we also secrete things like choline, creatinine, and penicillin. So drugs may be, may be secreted here as well. Okay. So here we have a big table just from your book about where different things get reabsorbed or secreted. So here we can see, we've mostly talked thus far about the proximal tubule, bless you. So here we can see all the different things that you might expect to be reabsorbed here. So water is gonna be a big one. We talked about our salts. So we see those here, salts are basically ions. Uh, we're gonna talk about bicarbonate ions when we talk about pH, right? We've talked about glucose. We have other things reabsorbed here as well. And also going with that pH, but in the opposite direction, we'll have hydrogen ions secreted. And we can do the same thing for the following regions of the nephron. So in general, when we're looking at secretion, we're gonna see as pretty much always hydrogen ions or potassium, okay, all right. And we have secretion happening in the proximal tubule, the distal tubule and the collecting duct, but not this middle part of the nephron, this loop of Henle. Okay. Um, so this is just a note to let you know that, that we're gonna be all the way through section 18.3 in your textbook. Uh, so hopefully you saw my note, uh, making sure that you can answer the questions in the section in 18.3. We're going to continue on into 18.4 and 18.5, and we should be getting through at least clearance today. So we got some duplicated copies of those questions here. Okay. But we're going we're to move along and think about reabsorption and secretion as we move further here. Right now. Okay. So we have our mass reabsorber, the proximal tubule, lots and lots of stuff being reabsorbed, but we know that's unregulated reabsorption. When we get to the distal tubules and the collecting ducts, we are going to see regulation of what we are reabsorbing. So we're gonna be controlling what crosses in a much more careful way, particularly using um, the insertion of like different hormones and stuff. Okay, so we're gonna regulate what crosses our epithelium. And we can see a couple differences between the distal tubule collecting duct epithelium versus what we saw in the proximal tubule. So just a reminder, because the proximal tubule was our mass reabsorber, right, one of the things that was noticeable there was that brush border. So that apical membrane with lots of microvilli. And this gives us a good surface area to reabsorb tons and tons of stuff. By the time we get to the distal tubule, we've done the bulk of our reabsorption. So when you look at that apical membrane, Got some projections, but but it's not a brush border. It's not the same. We're not increasing the surface area to that degree here, because at this point, we're not trying to do as much reabsorption. There, there's going to be a much more limited, controlled way of moving things across these cells. Okay. And in our proximal tubule, we had a kind of leaky epithelium, right? We had some kind of loose, leaky tight junctions, not sealing too well so that we could do a little bit of paracellular transport, right? We saw that some things were kind of squeezing through the edges of the cell. So some things were kind of going around. Um, 
when we're looking at reabsorption of water. That's just something that can happen in the proximal tubule. That can't happen by the time we get to the end of the nephron. So these tight junctions are actually tight. They're actually forming a tight seal here, completely across the cell layer. Um, both of these regions, we, we had mitochondria um, for the reason of sometimes we're doing active transport, which requires energy, requires ATP, mitochondria, helping us make enough ATP. This is just a, a bigger picture of that same picture here, right? So we have our basolateral membrane. So that's the part of the membrane that faces the blood. So the paratubular capillaries would go down here at the bottom in this image. The apical membrane faces the lumen, so the hollow part. Uh, that tube of the nephron. So this would be touching anything that's in the filtrate, seeing all that stuff flowing past. Okay. All right. So the section that we haven't talked about for the nephron yet, um, we're not going to go into detail quite yet, but one of the reasons that we are able to regulate reabsorption and do more reabsorption uh, in the distal tubule and collecting duct is that we're going to see that the loop of Henle going down into the renal medulla is going to create conditions here in the renal medulla that change our osmotic pull on the fluid going through the tubules at this point. So we're going to be able to concentrate urine before it leaves the kidney in part because of how the loop of Henle changes what the actual environment of this kidney tissue is like. So we will talk about that in detail when we talk about exactly what the loop of Henle looks like. Um, but in terms of how it contributes to our reabsorption, filtration, secretion, excretion. We wanna think of it um, not so much as doing one of those processes a ton itself, but as setting us up to do a bunch of reabsorption as the distal parts of our nephron move through that space. So we're gonna concentrate urine in part because of how the loop of Henle changes the properties of the kidney. This is gonna help us keep enough water in our bloodstream. As we talk about the, the final process, right? So we got filtration, reabsorption, secretion, now excretion. We can think about excretion rates and we can think about a concept called clearance. We'll talk about the excretion rate first, okay. So fundamentally, if you want something to be excreted, you want to lose something from your body. To excrete something, the amount that leaves your body, so the amount of the substance excreted, is pretty simply going to be how much came into your, into your nephron in the first place. So the amount filtered. So that's the part that came out of the plasma, really filtered at the glomerulus and is in the filtrate. Bowman's capsule continuing through the rest of the nephron. We're going to have to add in anything that gets secreted. So if you add stuff from the blood and the paratubular capillaries to say the proximal tubule, and right, it's in that filtrate. So we got to add that in there. And then we're going to subtract away anything that got reabsorbed. So anything that went back into the paratubular capillaries, anything that went back into the bloodstream, is logically not going to end up in your urine, right? So it's not going to add in to the amount of that substance getting excreted. Okay. So in terms of measurable concepts, right? When we're thinking about what is getting into the nephron in the first place, right? We'd be thinking about like our filtered load. So that was where we multiplied our glomerular filtration rate times the concentration of that freely filtered solute, right? So we like multiplied the amount of glucose in the blood times 125, which is our typical uh, glomerular filtration rate, okay? We're gonna add in that amount secreted. So we could have a rate for our secretion as well, the rate at which we're taking that solute out of the paratubular capillaries and putting it into the nephron and adding it in. 
And then we are going to want to subtract away whatever is reabsorbed. So we're subtracting um, whatever got reabsorbed as measured by its reabsorption rate. Okay. So if we compare these numbers, right, since we're just doing basic subtraction here, right, stuff that went into the nephron versus stuff that left the nephron, right, to figure out how much is actually leaving your body. If you've got the amount of solute excreted less than the filtered load, right, so you had some number going into your nephron in the first place, right, you reabsorb some, you're going to have a lower number when you look at the excretion, right? So if you think about, I'm going to make up some numbers here, I've been the made up numbers at the bottom, right? But like, say you have excretion of 10, right? That might mean you had a filtered load of like 12, maybe no secretion, and then you subtract it away two for the reabsorption, which is how you get that 10. So if you compare these two numbers, the filtered load and the excretion rate, you can immediately tell, are you reabsorbing or not, basically, right? So if this number, the excretion rate, is lower than that filtered load, that missing part had to go somewhere, it went back into your blood, got reabsorbed. Then we can do the same in terms of secretion, right? So let's say we have an amount of solute that is greater than our filtered load. So let's change our numbers, right? So let's say instead, we've got 12 of whatever it is being excreted, but our filtered load was only 10, right? So we subtracted away whatever was reabsorbed. We'll make it zero in this case. We're still not up to 12. So we must have secreted something in order to get to that larger number. So you can just compare filtered load and excretion to figure out what's going on on net in the middle of that nephron, whether it's secretion or reabsorption overall. So we have some examples here down at the bottom. So here we have a solute uh, where we had 0.08 millimoles per milliliter going through the glomerulus, right? So calculating out, right, times our glomerular filtration rate, that gives us 12 millimoles of the solute ending up in the nephron, right? So that would be our filtered load, that amount filtered, okay? We can see that our amount excreted ultimately is only nine millimoles. So we know already that on net, we must have had reabsorption because we're missing three millimoles, right? So we can see that this is true. Overall, we had more reabsorption happening. In this example, we did have some amount secreted, but not as much as uh, we had reabsorption. We see the same situation here happening with our water. So we have 150 milliliters of water being filtered out of the plasma per minute. We're only gonna excrete three, sorry, five milliliters in our urine in this example, okay? So we immediately know that we must have reabsorbed a lot of water. So in fact, we don't secrete water. That wasn't on the list of substances secreted. So we don't expect mm -hmm. any secretion at all. So 145 milliliters that's missing is coming from that reabsorption, mostly in the proximal tubule, but also in the distal tubules and the collecting duct, depending on our regulatory conditions. So depending on what hormones are present, uh, that'll happen to varying degrees in those locations. And this is just a big picture of that. Okay. All right. So there are technical ways that we can calculate clearance. I just want us to understand clearance at a kind of like gut level uh, for the purposes of this course for right now. So we're not going to do math about this. That's what I'm saying here. But when we're thinking about clearance, what we're saying right, is we've got blood 
coming into the nephron and at least the plasma and the things that are dissolved in it, right? So that freely filtered plasma, right? And eventually you're excreting this filtrate after you've made these adjustments. So when we talk about the clearance rate of something, you might talk about it like clearance of glucose, clearance of creatinine or clearance sodium, clearance of a medication, right? So you, basically what you're interested in is what's going on in the kidney? How well is it working? How well is it like, you can almost think of it as like cleaning your blood of that substance. So that's what's going on with our clearance. So usually, right, with our normal um, glomerular filtration rate, we have a glomerular filtration rate of 125 milliliters per minute, right? So we're going to think of it as being a line here. So the substance called inulin, right? We've cleared 125 milliliters per minute of blood of that inulin. So on net, in terms of what's going on with our kidney, it didn't secrete or reabsorb. It just excreted what was in that 125 milliliters per minute. So that's how much of the blood got cleaned of the inulin. However, sometimes we're going to see a clearance rate that is much higher, right? So some of our substances up here, right? You clear more plasma technically per minute uh, than you actually had filtrate going into the nephron. And the reason you would get that, those numbers that are higher than your glomerular filtration rate have to do with the actual calculations for clearance, um, which have to do with the filtered load and the excretion rate and, and those concentrations. Um, but are kind of like, rule of thumb, easy bit here, right, is if you are clearing more plasma than is actually going into the nephron, getting filtered into the nephron in the first place, then that extra is probably coming because you're secreting that substance into the nephron later on. If you have lower clearance than the glomerular filtration rate, okay, this means that you've reabsorbed that substance, right? So the amount of plasma where you removed that stuff is much lower, right? So it looks falsely lower than the actual glomerular filtration, right? So that's an indication that that substance was being reabsorbed. So we're not going to go through the exact math of calculating clearance, uh, but this is how you can kind of shorthand think of what's going on when you see numbers related to these. We're gonna move forward. We're gonna think about the concept of balance. And we're gonna start with thinking about how your body maintains water balance. So how we maintain the appropriate amount of water in our bloodstream. And then later on, we'll talk about how we maintain appropriate concentrations of other things like electrolytes. So how we balance our electrolytes in the blood as well. So we're going to think first about this concept of balance. And here, as we're thinking about water balance, this is where we're really going to want to remember the action of the loop of Henle. So in the loop of Henle, we're going to be setting up a situation in the kidney that's going to really let us concentrate urine and minimize water loss. So having a loop of Henle that's functioning appropriately, it's going to be really important for allowing uh, us to keep the body in balance ultimately. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna start a little further. So when we say that we have water balance, what we're saying is that you take in water in a number of different ways throughout your daily life, right? So hopefully you're drinking water. Everybody remember to drink your water, right? So that's part of your water intake. You are also metabolically producing some water. So water is sometimes a byproduct of chemical processes. So some of the water in your plasma has to do with chemical reactions happening in your body. Okay. 
So we can think of those as kind of like water inputs to our system. And then in terms of water outputs, right, we have the water that you are actually excreting, right, basically as waste, so in your urine. And we're also going to subtract away any water that gets used, right? So if your cells use some water to do something, right, we need, need water as a reactant in some other chemical reactions, right? That's not going to be in your plasma anymore either. So that can also play a role in your water balance. So here we have a picture of all the things that are kind of like going on with water in an average day. Okay, so on the whole, usually your total body water is somewhere in the neighborhood of 42 liters per day, okay? Now, in terms of how you get that amount, right? So some of it is coming from ingestion. So drinking water or eating food that has water in it, right? You get water from solid food as well, right? So to get that into your plasma, you'd be absorbing it from uh, your gastrointestinal tract, which is going to be our next unit. Okay. So that goes into your total body water. And then we have about 0.3 liters per day coming from cellular metabolism. So we've got water as a byproduct of chemical reactions. That's adding into your total body water as well. Now you're going to be losing some of that water as urine is what we're focusing on for the purposes of our renal unit for the most part, right? So you're filtering lots of water out of the plasma going into the nephron from the glomerulus, going into the renal tubules, getting excreted out, right? You might be secreting substances. We don't do much secretion of water, but that would go into a renal tubule if we did, going out as urine, right? Other places we lose water are things like sweating or insensible loss. So think like you're breathing out some water vapor, right? So things you wouldn't notice, things you don't sense, uh, but are happening on a daily basis. So those are ways we're losing water. There will be some water coming out of your digestive tract being excreted as well. All right. So we got water inputs and water outputs all going on all day long. What we want is for your total body water to stay about the same, regardless of how we have changes in input and output, right? Like we don't want to change your blood volume a lot and your blood, the plasma is largely made up of water, right? We don't want you to get super dehydrated. We also actually don't want you to have too much water in your body either, right? You can end up with swelling, um, not great. You don't want to have a lot of extra water either. So we want water to be entering your system and exiting your system at the same time. When we talk about balance generally, right, we might talk about water balance. So you want water entering your system and then exiting your system at the same rate. Same thing's going to be true about a solute, right? So you want to eat salt and also excrete salt at roughly the same rate because we like to keep like our sodium concentration surrounding our cells consistent because we know that like those sodium gradients are super important for uh, the function of cells, right? Like we saw that those gradients were really important for things like action potentials, muscle function, uh, all that good stuff. So we want the total quantity staying in your body to be the same. Doesn't always happen. So we say that you're in positive balance Basically, if you're taking in more of that substance, be it solute or water, then you are excreting out, right? So if you're taking in more than you're losing, you're in positive balance, you're going to see that total body water or total amount of a solute in your body increase. If you're in negative balance, it means you're losing more than you're taking in. So you're going to see that total body water, potentially like your blood volume decreasing, uh, and we can start to imagine impacts on your system of those changes. Okay. When we're thinking about water, really our, our biggest concern 
is about our blood volume. So blood volume, how much blood you have, and therefore also related to your blood pressure, because if you have more volume, that's going to affect the pressure in your bloodstream as well, which is going to affect things like how's your heart working, how stressed out are your arteries, stuff like that. So normovolemia just means normal volume. So that would be a normal volume of blood specifically. So remember an emia ending should be a signal to you. We're talking about the blood. Here we've got the vol for volume, normal for normal, normal. If we describe hypervolemia or hypovolemia, what we're saying is that we have something going on that's changing that normal blood volume. So hyper means more, extra. So hypervolemia means that we have a high blood volume. So this means that we have positive water balance, right? So to have a high blood volume, this means you're taking in a bunch of water and not getting rid of it. Hypovolemia, hypo means low, right? So this is going to be a low blood volume. So this would mean even though you're losing uh, blood volume, right? So either through excretion or if there's something wrong, some type of damage, you might actually be losing blood, right? And you're not replacing it through intake of water. Okay. So these would be problems if you don't keep things in the appropriate so it's important to us that we reabsorb water and also that we control how much water that we reabsorb. So we saw that in the proximal tubule, we're not regulating anything. We're just reabsorbing a bunch of stuff, but it's not controlled. So this is where 70% of your water reabsorption is happening, but it's not the whole story. So in the distal tubule and in the collecting ducts, this is where we can fine tune the reabsorption of water to keep your blood volume where it should be, right? So you're gonna adjust the concentration of the filtrate and therefore the concentration of your urine as you regulate how much water you're taking back into the plasma in order to keep your blood volume up or I guess to, to put your blood volume down. So 20% of that additional reabsorption is gonna happen in the distal tubule. And then the final 10% of the water reabsorption is gonna happen in the collecting ducts leading out of the nephron. So our principal hormone that's going to be helping us regulate the reabsorption of water in these regions is something called ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Later on, we'll get to the exact way in which that hormone allows us to control how much water we are reabsorbing or not. Okay. So reminders about how our water is moving, right? So when we think about water movement, we are thinking primarily about osmosis, right? So water is moving from wherever we have lots of water, so high water concentration to areas of low water concentration in practice, or sorry, yeah, in practice, we often report not water concentrations, but solute concentrations. So you want to think about them as the inverse of each other. So if there's not much water, there would be lots of solute comparatively. And if there's lots of water, that solute is spread out a lot more, so we'd have less of it. Okay. So we've got this, this situation where we have some total amount. We're thinking about some of it being water, some of it being solutes. So if we have a report on lots of water, high concentration of water, low concentration of water, we can simply go high to low. But if we have a report just about solutes, if the solutes are not able to travel down their own gradient, right, because they can't cross that cell membrane, we will have water movement to compensate, right? So water will move to come water down this extra solute 
if the solute can't move on its own. So that's our process of osmosis, water diffusing down its concentration gradient, um, which means that it's going up a solute gradient when we look at those solutes it's in your body. Another way we can think about this, which we mentioned when we were thinking about the proximal tubule, you can think about uh, water reabsorption as following solute reabsorption. So like what we're saying there, okay, when we had a proximal tubule cell, which I'm not going to draw accurately, right? As we had solute moving and creating high solute concentration, in the paratubular fluid and then the plasma, right? Water is gonna go ahead and follow that so that it can start to water down that region. Okay? So this is what's happening in your kidneys as we reabsorb water. It's moving towards these areas of high solute concentration. We might have high solute concentration because we reabsorbed a bunch of solute. So this brings us to the medulla. Okay. So when we have a kidney, right? This, this kidney bean kind of shape, right? That's why it's called that. We have an outer cortex. And then we have the inner medulla or medulla, okay? So we have different properties in these different regions. And particularly, we're going to see that we're going to have different osmotic gradients. So basically, we're going to have different amounts of solutes pulling on the water as we get deeper and deeper into the kidney. So that's what the loop of Henle does, is it makes the properties of the medulla here in the center of the kidney different than the properties in the cortex. Okay. So the loop of Henle has to make that inside part of the medulla really, really salty so that when the collecting duct comes back through it, we can reabsorb more water, basically. So the loop of Henle is shown here, right? And we're gonna see that we have a countercurrent multiplier as well. So what the countercurrent multiplier is, is, it's just talking about the fact that we both go down into the medulla with the loop of Henle and then come back up. And we can see that our paratubular capillaries are also going down into the medulla, right? We have paratubular capillaries here, but this blood vessel is continuing, okay? You can see that we have opposite directions going on next to each other, right? So counter current just means like opposite direction. So that's gonna be important for this setup as well. So the osmolarity of our kidney increases as you get deeper into the kidney, basically. Okay. So what that means, right? In the cortex, the fluid between the cells, so in this case, the paratubular fluid, also any interstitial fluid that's just like between cells, it's going to have a osmotic pull about 300. Okay, so that's the osmolarity of the cortex here. As we go deeper and deeper into the kidney, we cross into the medulla. Right At first at this top parts of the medulla, we can see that we have a really similar osmolarity. But by the time we get into the deepest parts of the medulla, we're at about 1400 milliosmoles. So what this means is that we're having a stronger and stronger pull on water as we go deeper and deeper into the kidneys. So this is critical to water reabsorption because it means that as you go deeper and deeper into the kidney, you have the possibility of absorbing more and more water, which is important as you are concentrating urine more and more, you need that strong pull as you get towards basically the endpoints of uh, all these tubules and ducts going through the kidney. So this is going to be dependent on that loop of Henle, and it's the result of this countercurrent multiplier. So we're gonna walk through how this happens. 
Um, so we're going to start out with the fluid in the distal tubule. All right. Actually, mm, yeah, we're going to think about the fluid basically as we walk through. We're going to look at the osmolarity through each region of the nephron. But the fluid in the distal tubule will eventually have a concentration of 100 milliosmoles. As it goes down, we may be removing more and more water. In the cortical interstitial fluid, we're going to have a or an osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles. And we'll see what the impact of all this stuff is. General functions of the loop of Henle. Okay. In the ascending limb, so actually let's back up. So going down in the loop of Henle, that's our descending limb. That's our down direction. Going up, that's our ascending limb. Okay. Cool. All right. So we see different properties of these two regions. Specifically, we're going to see that this ascending limb, so going up, is impermeable to water. Okay. So we are going to be able to have water moving through some parts of the loop of Henle, but not others. Okay. So in this ascending limb, we don't have water moving. So we it's impermeable to water. But what we do is we actively transport salts out of the filtrate and into the medulla, right? So we're doing active transport here. So what we're doing here is basically we're filling up this part of the kidney with lots and lots of sodium and chloride ions, right? Setting up that pull on the water that's in our filtrate going through the nephron. So we're setting up a pull by creating high osmolarity in the medulla, okay? which means that the filtrate that was going through this first part of the loop of Henle, this descending limb, this first part is permeable to water. Okay? It is permeable to water. It's going through this salty region set up by the later part of the loop of Henle. So we're gonna see that we have some movement of water out of the filtrate in the descending loop of Henle and into the medulla and then the bloodstream. The descending limb of the loop of Henle doesn't transport any salts. That's all happening in the ascending limb. Okay, that is the overview, the big picture of what's happening, but we're gonna walk through exactly how this gradient gets set up. Okay. So we're starting with our tubular fluid. So that filtrate coming out of the proximal tubule, going through the cortex. Okay. So we have mass reabsorption going on in the proximal tubule. And functionally, what we do to the fluid there, that filtrate going through the nephron, is we reabsorb until we're at equilibrium with the cortex, right? So the cortex has an osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles. So our tubular fluid in that proximal tubule just matches the 300 milliosmoles. Now, about this diagram, which is from your textbook, want to make you aware that what this is showing you is how we set up the entire gradient in the kidneys, how we set up this medullary osmotic gradient. Our final state that you would expect to see in an adult human kidney, so like in your kidney, is this one. So what we're talking about all the way through all these steps is how we get to what we actually observe in a kidney, right? So when we look at an actual adult kidney, we are going to see this 300 milliosmoles in the paratubule, sorry, in the proximal tubule fluid going into the kidney. But if we look step by step, we're talking about how we set up this final condition. So the numbers in this first image don't match number seven yet. So if you get confused, what I'm saying is that number seven has the most important numbers to remember. These other steps 
are, we're going to be walking through the function of each of these regions to understand them. If you got lost, come back to this final diagram. That's, that's the most important. Thing. All right. So our tubular fluid, going through, coming to equilibrium with the cortex, all good. And that is also what we see happening in your own adult kidney. As we go into the medulla, without any osmotic gradient set up yet, so if you start with a brand new nephron, no active transport has been happening yet, nothing, you just have everything at equilibrium, right? So everything would just kind of stay at 300, right? So that's our, our starting out point, okay? So as your nephron begins to function, right? So as we start to add on, these properties of the loop of Henle. We're going to think about the ascending limb and how it's pumping out salts, right? So it is putting a bunch of solutes into the medulla here, okay? So through active transport, so using energy, we're pumping these solutes into the interstitial fluid in the medulla, which now is going to create a higher osmolarity in the medulla than in the cortex, right? So it has more salts, it has higher osmolarity. So remember, higher numbers for osmolarity mean a greater pull on water. So higher, stronger. So this higher osmolarity pulls on the water more. And now the fluid coming into those regions comes to equilibrium, right? So it was at 400 milliosmoles. So now, Stuff coming along through the cortex is at 300 milliosmoles because the um, cortex is at 300 milliosmoles. If it's in the loop of Henle in this descending limb, it comes to equilibrium here with the properties of the loop of Henle. So it's now from 300 to 400 as it crosses into this region. And because we've pumped out solutes, right? So we removed solutes. Solutes are what add into the osmolarity. So those missing solutes mean that as we're pumping out, we dropped down the osmolarity of the filtrate in that ascending limb. So I can see that we're at time. So we're going to continue walking through this stuff on Monday. Um, we got a lot of steps. So I, I do recommend looking it over a bit before we get there. Like I said, if you're getting lost, focus on this final piece of the image we'll understand how we got to that state.